Put that coffee down. I'm not here to waste your time, okay? And I certainly hope you're not here to waste mine. So I'm gonna keep this short. Helen, we're both in sales. Let me tell you why I suck as a salesman. The most valuable commodity I know of is information. Wouldn't you agree? Coffee's for closers only. Hey there, friends. Welcome back to the Behind Your Back podcast with me, Bradley Hartman. We're sponsored by Boise Cascade. to help you move faster and build stronger. Boise Cascade engineered wood products. They make it easier to get more done. And our friends at Materials Exchange. Materials Exchange is the LBM industry's answer to E-Trade. It is your digital marketplace for lumber and panels. And on this podcast, we talk about leadership, personal productivity, time management, and the craft of selling in the construction industry. And my guest today, Mr. Chansey. Halverson of Gulf Eagle Supply. He's a branch manager in Fargo, North Dakota. He had this idea to deliver massive practical, tactical tips about this craft of selling. He reached out to us via email with one of the longtime, first time variety of emails. I am a regular listener to your podcast and I have an idea. Well, guess what, Chancy? We're in the business of ideas. I'm listening. So I asked, what's up? And he said, hey, there's this idea that many people seem to understand that it takes eight, 10, 12 touches, events to reach out to a single prospect to finally break through. But he wrote, however, the area where I see salespeople struggle is finding legitimate reasons to make additional rounds of contact. They know they should, but after an initial cold call to set a meeting, one, a face-to-face meeting, two, and maybe another meeting to quote-unquote follow up or drop off a sample, three, they are out of gas. His idea for the show would be to brainstorm and find unique, valuable ways to make additional rounds of contact. And I said, all right, let's do it. So what ideas do you have? And man, did he come prepared. He came with lots of unique ideas. I was thoroughly impressed He was basically running the show, as you will listen, but he was driving the bus and I was just hanging on and he did a fantastic job. So I'm thrilled Chansey reached out to us. So Chansey went to school at the University of North Dakota, Grand Forks, the Fighting Hawks. Uh, He comes from a ranching background, which I have zero context for. He's a high school basketball referee, which I showed great restraint given the March Madness, my Fighting Illini got a number one seed. I showed incredible restraint by not going into any rabbit hole talking about basketball. And we've had Todd Skaggs on the show in the past. I think there are a ton of analogies and metaphors and insights from how people are referees or umpires, depending on what they are. And Todd Skaggs is a collegiate football referee. And we've had him on the show in the past. And just the way that they think about being a referee, there's a ton of insights that we can apply to sales. Nonetheless, luckily... For you, because we didn't have a four-hour podcast, we were able to uh, keep that in check, but we provide some really practical, tactical tips that I think are immediately relevant now and more so in the future as we get away from these uh, very intense supply chain and pricing issues that we have now. This is something that is relevant here, but is going to be evergreen because as human beings, we need to overcome this internal resistance that we have to prospecting, finding ways to break through, and just immediate ways to deliver value that are not related to what we're grappling with right now, with the supply chain issues and the pricing. So I'm thrilled to share my conversation with Mr. Chansey Halverson of Gulf Eagle Supply in Fargo, North Dakota. So Mr. Chansey Halverson, welcome to the show. Thank you, Brad, for having me. Yeah, thrilled you reached out with a very specific tactical issue that we all deal with, me included. And since you did reach out, I've been going down a rabbit hole here. So thrilled that you were able to make time. Before we get rolling here, let's start off with our first four. Do you remember, do you remember the first music album you either purchased or received? Yes, I do. It was a greatest hits album. It was Garth Brooks, The Hits is the album I received. There you go. This may or may not surprise you. We get Garth Brooks often, and I guess he did sell like 500 million episodes, so that shouldn't be totally surprising, but the hits, that's awesome. What about the first concert you attended? Well, I was going to college at the University of North Dakota, Grand Forks, and Everclear came to town. Yeah, 
at the college and we went to that at the Ralph Ingolstead Arena. So I heard Everclear in concert. Got it. Well, what year was this? I would say this was 2002. So they were definitely past their prime. Okay. All right. <laughs> but it was still good to hear them. So it was fun. It was a uh, free concert, so we didn't even pay anything as students to go. So it was pretty sweet. Even better. Yeah. So I was in my senior year of high school was uh, 95, 96. And I remember Everclear, Santa Monica was kind of the jam. They were they were a really big deal there for a minute. 2002, yeah, probably playing North Dakota Grand Forks free shows. That sounds about <laughs> right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. They were on the casino circuit next, I'm sure. So. Right. <laughs> All right. Do you remember uh, your first paying job where you you were getting a W-2. Okay. Well, I did get paid growing up on the family ranch in Northwest Minnesota, but I won't really count that working for my dad. My first paid job outside was pumping gas at a full service Senex gas station in Thief River Falls, Minnesota. So, All right. What, tell me briefly, tell me about the, tell me about your ranch. I don't know anything about ranching, but tell me about it. What's going on in there? You know, there aren't too many ranches in Minnesota, but the closer you get to the North Dakota border, they come in. We have okay. about 350 head of cattle, Black Angus primarily, about 40 horses. I grew up riding horse and driving tractors. And yeah, it's probably where I got my work ethic. You yeah. definitely learn how to work hard on a farm and a ranch. So, For sure. How big is a ranch? Oh, geez. What kind of acreage do you need for a couple hundred cattle? Well, we have a lot of it in different types of agricultural use, like okay. CRP and things, but it's a few thousand acres for sure. So. Got it. I was once told about center pivot irrigation, and I've used that as a punchline whenever we talk about farms or ranches. That's about all I know, but uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll keep moving along here, Chansey. Uh, last but not least, first vehicle. 1984 Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme two-door. Had some pretty sweet rims on it, some subwoofers in the back seat. Yeah, it was a pretty cool car. I actually miss it. My brother actually purchased this car after I sold it. So it's still sitting in his garage. And if I ever win the Powerball, maybe I'll buy it back and restore it. So Got it. All right. Well, so I'm going to tee this up because you hit on something that I've seen on LinkedIn, probably like you, no less than 5,000 times. And it just says, and I'll just read it briefly here. It says, sales statistics. 48% of salespeople never follow up with a prospect. 25% of salespeople make a second contact and stop. 12% of salespeople only make three contacts and stop. Only 10% of salespeople make more than three contacts. 2% of sales are made on the first contact. 3% of sales are made on the second contact, right? So it goes in and then says 80% of sales are made on the fifth to 12th contact. And this is kind of where it always gets me. I'm a little, I see down at the bottom, it says source. National Sales Executive Association. I'm a little bit curious on where these stats truly come from, but when you read this, what comes to mind and what caused you to kind of reach out? Well, like you said, I've seen that many times. It's been brought up in sales meetings I've been at, mm -hmm. company meetings, things like that. Obviously designed to show that it's important to be persistent as a salesperson. Right. My experience dealing with different territory managers outside salespeople is I think that most of them are not lazy. Most of them know this to be true, but they do struggle with coming up with relevant reasons to continue to reach out to a client. They leave the first voicemail. Maybe they meet them in person. They say hi. Maybe you get to stop back with your business card and a box of donuts and they run out of steam. Mm -hmm. And it's just really a lack of creativity. And as I told you, I've been a long time listener to your podcast. And I think that what it ultimately comes down to is they struggle with ideas to bring value to a prospect that they can get across in a short email, a short text message, a short phone conversation, voicemail, et cetera. And maybe really want to think about and brainstorm and say, okay, what are some real world examples that we could actually give to people that they could use when they're prospecting if they aren't able to come up with them on their own, I guess. So I love it. So I have a challenge for you. I've kind of kept this secret, but I think we can do it between you and I, if this does in fact take up to 12 contacts, so 12 touches to make a sale. Do you think between the two of us, we could come up with 12 ways to deliver value? I'll tell you what, I can bring you six, Brad. You're going to have to uh, do, do your <laughs> share of the lifting then. I don't think you understand how this whole podcast thing works. All right. You come with all <laughs> the, the labor, right? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think I'd written down as I was thinking about this. Sometimes I, I, I believe it's a, a lack of imagination. And I think if you think about salespeople in our industry, a big part of what we do is we solve problems for existing clients and customers of ours. Yep. Yet sometimes when we switch from, you know, kind of this 
account management, customer service, whatever you want to call it, to true prospecting, it's like we're starting with a clean slate. And there's this HBO documentary. I'd strongly recommend it to anybody, but it's called Everything is Copy. And it's about this. She's a writer and she was in movies. She wrote When Harry Met Sally. Her name's Nora Ephron. And she grew up in a family where her parents were both writers in Hollywood. And she would have this experience of going and watching these movies that her parents had written. And there would be these little vignettes and these snapshots or things that she had said. And she realized that her parents were constantly looking at their own family looking for copy, looking for reasons, looking for stories, because that was the value they could bring to Hollywood. And I really like that analogy because I said, all you have to do is look around to the ways that you're currently serving existing customers or listening to current customers talk about their, when we talk about our NFPOs, needs, fears, pain, and opportunities for growth. It's more than likely that your prospects are facing those as well. And if you can kind of bring something around those NFPOs, you can deliver value. So what comes to mind like immediately? What would, what's the tip of the spear? What's like one of six for you? This one is very relevant. Obviously right now with a lot of the supply chain issues, the extended lead times in the industry, one way I would come at a customer is with a product that I knew was maybe in short supply. Okay. I'll give the example. I'm in the business of selling roofing materials, my current job. I know right now that green shingles are hard to find. Okay. So a way I might call a customer is ring them up, say, I just wanted to let you know, we've been seeing that extended lead times are out there on green colored shingles. Do you have any products or projects, I should say, coming up in the next couple of weeks where you're going to need something like this for the next month for that matter? Mm -hmm. If you do, I do have some on the ground. And I was wondering if you might be interested in locking them in with me. Yep. That could be a voicemail. It could be an email, et cetera. But I think that that will generate interest in the customer's mind. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think you gave a really great specific product selection there that you think would be helpful. But I think what you're talking about generally is I'm looking around corners for you. Now, given what's happening right now with the supply chain and the market, fairly confident you're going to sell those shingles, especially if you know that demand is outstripping supply. It's not a question of if you're going to sell them, right? You're not, you're not trying to sell a bushel of beat up avocados. You know this stuff is going to sell. And what you're doing is you're looking around corners in the future and thinking down the line. And the reality is for many subcontractors and GCs, they really struggle to look further than a week or two down the line. If you can help them do that, you can bring immediate value. So I, I love that. Yeah. I think that we have to act as basically unpaid employees for our clients' businesses. And I will oftentimes tell them that I am an advocate for your business you don't pay me. I mean, granted, you do in a way by buying goods yeah. and services from me, hopefully, but you don't have me on the payroll. And my job is to look out for your success and anticipate problems for you before they happen. In fact, I, I, I always give this example, too, in our business, Brad, is that I used to say what good service is, is recognizing a problem for the customer before they know they have one. Right. We would have a lot of people that would, would take an order over the phone, right? And the customer is, is giving them their material list and they're rattling it off. Well, if they go through their whole order for, again, roofing materials, and they don't give you the starter strip for that order, right? and our inside salesperson writes it down, and we send it out exactly as ordered, did we provide good service for that customer? Mm -hmm. No. right? We didn't ask them an obvious question to prevent a mistake by them. Good service is asking that question, preventing that mistake before they even know it, knows it occurred. So, Yeah, and I think we experience this all ourselves. And I think a humble checklist can be the solution here is you bought, Chancy, you bought A, B, C, and D. We know from looking at our own metrics, 90% of the time when you buy A, B, and C, and D, you're going to need E. Are you deliberately not selecting this? And especially if you're just, maybe you're a laborer or someone lower on the hierarchy and you're just running to get this material, they might be like, I don't know. I was just told to get this. Well, is it possible on the job site you guys are busy? The other guy's screaming material list down to you from 30 feet in the air and either you didn't hear it or he forgot it. Is that possible, right? And that's where just like simple checklists can really not only help you, but it shows that, hey, not only do we understand our business, right? I can take an order and I can give it to you, no problem. But if I can help you think about maybe things that you might've forgotten, dude, again, different level of value there. So I love that. You mentioned another thing that I... I couldn't agree with more. And I can tell you as a business owner, when 
partners of ours bring this to us. It changes our relationship. But you said, I used to find a lot of value in bringing a lead to a customer or a prospect. Go into that a little bit. Well, bringing a lead or a sales opportunity for the customer that they're unaware of is probably the biggest thing we can do for a customer. Mm -hmm. When I would like to bring a lead to a customer, I like to do it even more detailed. I mean, we would frequently, for example, maybe find something on a builder's exchange on Dodge, a project that may be bidding. Some people will reach out and say, hey, Brad, did you know that the uh, Rocky Mountain condo project is going to be bid? And you might say, no, I didn't. And okay, now you know. To me, that is not bringing a high level of value, that's right. some value there. I like to do the, the legwork and the homework before I even bring it to the customer. I find the project, I'll do the takeoff if need be. I'll make sure that our products that we have are specified and approved by the architect. I'll get all the contact information. I'll even get the bidding forms together for the customer. I'll deliver the quote and I'll bring it all as a package deal and say, hey, now Brad, this Rocky Mountain condo project is bidding. Would you like to submit a bid? Mm -hmm. And once you've already delivered it with all the work on your end basically done, so they go, so I need to put my labor number on this and hand it in. Yep. That is real value to the customer. Now, if they win that project or awarded that job, I got a good feeling that they're buying that from you. So Yeah. And I would tell you, if they don't, you learn some <laughs> very valuable information about who you want to right. partner with in the future. We got a couple. I've contributed nothing so far. This all feels very, very right right now, Chansey. Why don't we keep going? What else is up? So we've got you looking around corners with some material and limited supply. Bringing a lead is just, man, that is incredible value. What else comes to mind? Well, in our area, one of the biggest things that contractors, builders are struggling with right now is honestly labor. Mm -hmm. I would say almost every contractor that walks in my office complains about not being able to find good help, good people. Builders are complaining about the lead time with subs, whether it's their roofing contractor, their framer, their plumber. So I think one way we can bring value is to reach out to a potential client, if it's a builder or a general contractor, and just plant a seed and say, how are your current installers doing? Are they being able to keep up with your work? If they are, great. But if not, I'd just like to let you know, we know a few guys, and mm -hmm. I'd be happy to make the introduction if you are interested. Now, in this market where I'm at in, in Fargo, that brings huge value. You might get more calls, calls back on that than anything else if you can bring them a potential installer, framer, what not electrician, because there's just a shortage and yeah. they need that. And you're solving probably their number one problem every day when you bring that to the table. I love that. I'm going to kind of connect on that. I think we can include at least one, if not two of these, but I think yeah, labor is obviously the tip of the spear of what we're challenged with right now. But I would also say, think of just talent in general. And I will, when under current circumstances, not as relevant, but it's just in general, I'll just say, hey, what are you guys planning once we get out of summer and we head into the fall? What do you think from a marketing standpoint? Do you have any kind of advertising initiatives? A lot of times they're not strong in that avenue. And I'd say, hey, we know someone we've worked with on a contract basis who's phenomenal helping subcontractors with marketing. And I've also just had things where just had a, a colleague who's extremely bright and we were having a conversation and I thought, you know what? I don't know what value these guys could bring, but I know Tom, he's smart, he's funny, he's been around. There's no super clear connection on why him and Chansey would get along, but I just have a feeling they would. And I would say, hey, Chansey, I was just thinking about you. I was talking to my buddy Tom. Here's what he does. And again, I don't know what the connection would be, but I know there'd be value. And I've done that in a few different circumstances. And sometimes those connections end up being really kind of lifelong friends. And you're able to really kind of change that dynamic. So just having a strong network and thinking about being that connector, I think is incredibly valuable. Yeah. And I mean, I've got another thing that another idea that goes right along with what you're saying there, Brad. Go. So an idea I will bring to a prospect, to a new target contractor is, are you looking for a way to differentiate your business? Well, most people, yes, I am looking for a way. Okay, what do yeah. you got? Sure. So a favorite one that I've come across is in our area is model homes or parade of homes models. Mm. It's a small practical technique. I will frequently go to a vendor we sell through, maybe it's a window manufacturer, and I'll say to them, okay, you guys have just come out with this brand new cool exterior window color or new grid pattern. Mm -hmm. If I can get a builder to put this into the spring parade of homes, 
would you offer that as a free upgrade if they order the windows? Okay. A lot of times the manufacturer will say, sure, we'd love to get that out the public side. Right. Now I come to the builder as a hero and say to them, hey, what do you guys think? There's a brand new color. It's really going to pop. It's an aesthetic. It's not a R value or something that people aren't going to see when they're walking through your model. They're going to see that from the street when they walk up. Yep. And I can get that to you at no extra charge. It's ready to go. I've already lined it up with the vendor, with the manufacturer. What do you think? I say, well, yeah, I mean, if I can do something to differentiate my home from every other home that's being built in town with another window brand or a white window, yeah, I want to do that. Mm -hmm. And now you've brought value along with that first order. And the best thing to me as the dealer is really didn't cost me anything. The manufacturer is going to take the price. I just solicited the deal. Yeah. Oh, I love that. And again, I think, yeah, you're right. It's a, it's you being a connector, trying to think how you can connect different people who might not otherwise make that connection. And I think along those lines, especially when you think about branding and marketing, lots of times company A is building directly across the street from company B, same school district, same shingles, same bricks, same style, what's different. And the, the old rule is you can be anything, but don't be boring. What yep. is getting people talking? And sometimes I had a specific example years ago. I won't mention the manufacturer, but it was, it was a window and it was very different and it was very polarizing. And what we found is people just liked talking about it. People say, I actually love this and here's why. And the husband would be like, I can't stand it. Here's why. It <laughs> got people talking. It's interesting. So finding something like that would be valuable. Now let's take a quick break to hear from one of our sponsors. With customers in mind, Boise Cascade makes work faster, stronger, and easier. How? Let's talk about faster. Boise Cascade Engineered Wood Products has nationwide distribution. Boise Cascade is always close to you with the right products, on-time delivery, and local support. Boise Cascade also offers BC Connect. It's your engineered wood profit center. Their free suite of software tools for EWP dealers ensures seamless communication and collaboration between sales professionals, designers, and operations managers to keep your projects moving forward. And as we've discussed in previous episodes in this show, they also have their SawTech technology. Optimize, cut, repeat. The SawTech automated processing allows Boise Cascade dealers to cut four times four times more BCI joists compared to manual cutting. Boise Cascade's preventive maintenance program, spare part inventory, and real-time monitoring keep your business running. Faster, stronger, easier. It's not just what Boise Cascade does, it's who they are. I'm gonna give us at least, at least two there. I'm gonna say we're up to five, all right? So kind of sharing a potential friend, delivering value, making a connection between a distributor or a manufacturer and a builder. Love that. What else you got? What's next? How about bringing an idea to value engineer a project to a customer that's going to save them either time or money? Recently, I looked at a project that we were bidding on and the architect wanted to put some gable dormers on top of an existing building, mostly for decorative element. They had it specked out or drawn with a 3.512 pitch or three and a half 12 pitch on this. Yeah. And they wanted triangle uh, decorative gable vents in each of these. Okay. Well, I looked at that and did some checking around with various manufacturers and found out that nobody had a three and a half slash 12 pitch gable vent that was standard size. Everything was custom. It was going to be costly. Went to back to the general contract that was awarded the project said, you know, if we can get this switch to a 412 pitch, it's all standard. You're going to save literally on this job thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. What do you think? He said, well, I don't see why that would be a problem. Let me bring it to the architect. He brings it to the architect. Yes, no problem. All of a sudden, we've saved him thousands of dollars on this project with a very small tweak. So I think anytime we can bring value engineering to a design, to construction mm -hmm. that they are not aware of, and that was a great example of how we could do that, you're probably going to build a lifelong customer at the minimum. You're going to get that first sale, I hope, but you're showing again that you're looking out for their best interests. Yeah. You're looking around corners. And again, I think this really goes to your thoughtfulness about that example of someone coming in with a series of items to buy A, B, C, and D, but they're not buying E and you're asking them, but just asking this question, we all want to work with people who are going to help us make, find and save money. And that's exactly what you're doing. Don't wait to be told 
hey, can you value engineer this? Or do you have any ideas? Just do it on your own proactively. It makes such a big difference. So I love that. Yeah, I think it, it works out really well. So ready for another one? Shoot. All right. How about bringing a way that they can say thank you to their customers without it costing them money? I think that a lot of our customers appreciate the business they have, and they're looking for creative ways to do it. Now, I will say this is a program our company offers, but a lot of people could do something similar. We offer a rebate for military members, veterans, or now with COVID to first responders. I tell my contractors, I say, now, isn't it a great way where you can go to a customer and tell them, do you happen to, did you happen to serve in the Navy, Mr. Smith? Yeah, actually I did. Well, how about if we can get you a rebate saying thank you for your service and we're going to do this roof and we're going to get you a rebate. Appreciate everything you've done for our country. And to the contract, he's saying, well, that does sound pretty good. And you're telling me that's not going to cost me anything. Right. Yeah. That's what I'm telling you. Right. Mm-hmm. So work with me and let me say thank you to your customer for you, but you get to take all the credit. And I think that there's a lot of value there. And sometimes they aren't even aware of creative ideas like that. Right. You may even bring that to them and they say, well, actually, that is a great idea. How about you do that? And I'll double or Mm -hmm. whatever the idea might be. But I think helping them to think of new ways to say thank you is a valuable element. Yeah, and I wrote down, I think this kind of is relevant in two ways. The first is, can you say thank you spending no money? Also, how can you say thank you by spending money? Like finding a unique way. You think of like $100, you can do an awful lot of things to say thank you in a very meaningful and thoughtful way with a hundred bucks. And kind of, we talked, we started kind of talking about this lack of imagination at the beginning. If you're trying to get someone's attention, I will often ask, Hey, if you were able to get a one-to-one meeting for 20 minutes with Chansey, what would that be worth to you? And they're like, Oh my God, he's a dream client, uh, 500 bucks. And I'll say, okay, imagine you had a $475 budget and you had 30 days to get a hold of him and to set a meeting. Do you think you could do it? And oftentimes there's no budget and People act like we couldn't spend $5 when landing Chansey as a customer would be like six figures of profit every year. So I was like, well, have a budget, run your business like a business, put a budget together and don't go crazy. But I'm like, hey, you give me $475 to try to get a hold of Chansey. I'm going to be creative and I'm going to find a way where he's like, I got to meet with this guy because he just sent me this and that. He's doing things to get my attention. I owe him this, right? There's, a, there's an element of reciprocity that comes there. Now that's an extreme measure. But if you can yeah. do it with 475, what about 50? What about 20? Find a way to be unique. I'll give you an idea on how you can do it for 50 or 20. So sure. they, the, we've had a deal. At least this will get you communication. Sometimes you can't even get the decision maker to pick up the phone or right. to take your text message or respond back to at least know you even have the right number, right? Yeah. What I would like to do in a case like that is if I know where their crew is working, okay. again, we're in roofing, we're in siding windows. Yep. I'll just go proactively And the owner probably is not on the job site, which is all fine and dandy. Sure. I'll go pick up a full sack load of McDonald's double quarter pounders and bring it all out to the job site. I'll bring just lunch unsolicited to the crew. Mm -hmm. I say, hey, guys, I uh, oh, you're up on the roof. You guys want to come out? I got you some free sandwiches here. Thank you very much. I just dropped my business card. That's all I do. Hey, looks like it's a hot day. Enjoy your day. Mm -hmm. And then I will send a text message later that afternoon telling the same decision maker. Hey, just want to let you know, I stopped by and brought you, brought your crew some lunch today. Hope they enjoyed it. I say nothing else that will get a response. It may be a one word. Thank you, Mm -hmm. but at least there might be some dialogue. And when they do thank me, I say, I know I've been trying to reach out for a while. Is there any interest in taking a meeting and you've bought yourself some goodwill? I think that uh, more often than not, a guy will say, you know what? Okay. One meeting, right? But that's what I was looking for in the first place. And it's a $20 fix, really. I mean, $20 at McDonald's could get you in the door to have that meeting. Yeah, I've done a variation on this, which is kind of interesting. I've had it break both ways really well and really, I don't say really poorly, somewhat poorly. (laughs) But you do your exact move and that you say, listen, I'm just delivering this. You don't leave a business card. You don't leave anything. And you just say, listen, here's my name. So you tell them, right? So they know who I am. However, this is 100% because of your boss and you name the guy. And you're like, all I ask you to do is I was told, right, he doesn't want to do this. He, he doesn't want to take all the credit. You just got to call him and tell him I delivered on his behalf and thank him. 
Now you can imagine. So this guy starts getting all these calls being like, thank you, boss. Thank you so much for this. Very generous. He's like, what? Right. You're giving him all the credit. Now right. there's an angle here that might be characterized as a little smarmy, but I'll tell you what, it's different. It gets people's attention. But to your point, again, doesn't cost a whole lot. And at the end of the day, you're delivering value to the guys that are, that are breaking their backs, making the work happen. So you can feel positive about that. Yeah, absolutely. All right. What do you got? I got eight right now. Free food. Eight, and I will, depending on where we're at and how much time we've got, I could go, my variation of that might be eight and a half, but keep rolling. What else you got? <laughs> well, I think that uh, another thing we can bring to a prospect, a target, right? I keep focusing on that. This isn't somebody that has to be an existing customer. This is brand new. Sure. Is a real service advantage. And I underline real, okay? Real, not <laughs> we have the best service in town. We have material and we deliver it on time. That's generic. Everybody's saying it. Everybody's doing it means nothing to the client. Nothing, nothing, nothing until you've proven it. Mm -hmm. But so when I say a real service advantage, I may find out that one of our roofing contractors is doing a apartment re-roofing project. This project might be four stories in the air. If I know they have that job and this prospect, I always call them up and say, well, how are you guys planning to get this product to the roof? Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to rent a lift. Okay. Oh, well, I don't know if you know this, but we have a knuckle boom truck that, unlike our competitors in town, can reach 44 feet straight up in the air. We mm -hmm. could lift these shingles to you. By the way, I just checked with the uh, price of lifts. How long are you going to need that? Oh, one week. It's this much per day. So by using us, you will save this much to do this project. Dollarize it right up front for them. Mm -hmm. Have the research done so you're not making them guess. You, you've already done the research, right? And now that is a specific service advantage. It's not you claiming some broad generic term. Right. They may say, no, we're good. We're going to use the lift. But you've at least brought a new idea to the table that shows them some real value. You mentioned one of my favorite words ever, dollarize, right? Quantify the pain. Quantify what they're doing and saying, hey, you would not absorb this cost if you were collaborating with us. And here's why. And it's not just on this job. It's on every other job where you have to go rent one of these. So love that idea of dollarizing it. And really, this is not complex math either. This is mm -hmm. what's the cost per day? How much time does it take for you to drive over to get it? Or what will that take in just coordination? Like you can run some basic numbers on indirect costs and then add that to direct costs. You put that in an email and then yep. especially that might be one where you know, if they're a prospect, you've been trying to get your foot in the door. Maybe that's one where you send this to like two or three people. Because maybe one guy's like, listen, I already ordered it. My buddy Jim rents it to us. It's not a big deal. You copy someone else who has some P&L responsibility. And they're like, whoa, I didn't realize it cost that. Why, don't, why wouldn't we consider this? The loyalty of the PM or the guy running the job might be different than someone else who's truly looking at from a strategic perspective or profitability. So quantifying the pain, dollarization, love that. Absolutely love it. Yeah, I really like your idea too of reaching out. I mean, frequently, this is a side note off the conversation, but I've ran into stumbling blocks getting any momentum going with a business owner. Mm -hmm. Either they're too busy to listen to me or they don't care. And I've moved down the chain into the project manager and found out that the project manager has way more discretion yeah. and buying decision than I realized. All of a sudden, you're getting backup business, secondary orders, all kinds of things the owner may not even be aware of. And instead of focusing on the top dog at the top of the food chain, we needed to move down one level to start. So, yeah, we could go off on a side note here because often I will talk to someone. They said, Hey, you know, I saw that thing on LinkedIn. It takes 12 times. I've reached out to the CEO 38 times over two years. Right. And I was like, why, what are you trying to sell? Uh, I work for Dunder Mifflin. We're trying to sell paper. I'm like, dude, <laughs> you only need to enter that buying cycle with the person who's at the highest level that can say yes. Like, don't go to the CEO if the CEO doesn't make that decision. Now, I never think it's a bad idea to try, if you believe you can deliver value, to get on their radar in some way is never a bad thing. However, to your point, don't fight the hard fight going through the front door with the Dobermans when you can take the side door and that's where those buying decisions are made. So that's a fantastic point. Yep. Cool, what, do you, what, what else you got? Well, so another one would be, it kind of goes back to uh, bidding things on a builder's exchange or projects that are out there that are specified by an architect. Okay. I found a skill and learned how to do product substitution requests. It isn't rocket science usually on these projects, okay. at least not in 
at least not in my area. Most of the architects are pretty receptive. Uh, you send a few item data sheets and show that products are relatively equal. But most contractors, they're not interested in wasting any time on that. They don't have time. They're barely, they're barely having enough time to get the bid in by the uh, two o'clock bid deadline on Thursday, yep. right? So if I can go ahead and find a few value engineered products, preferably ones that I sell that my competitors don't, Naturally, that's best case scenario, and get them in front of the architect. Now I have a leg up that I'm delivering to our customer, right? Where I go, hey, so this is what was originally specified. Right. Here's your first bid. I have already had this approved, and this is only products that you can buy at Gulf Eagle Supply. Here's bid number two. I think you should use number two and go in, and you have an advantage over your competitors going after this project. Mm -hmm. Now, that's value up front right away, and he says, wow, that's a good idea. If he gets that job, again, I'd say there's a strong possibility I'm getting that order. So I'd like to bring that value up front and do the legwork there. A lot of these guys aren't business guys. They're not used to dealing with the architect. If we can deal with the architect for them, right. we've added value. For sure. And I think I just wrote down dirty work, man. You're doing the dirty yep. work. You're doing, you're doing the paperwork and you're asking those questions. And I've just found there are certainly some architects that are on the more of the snooty side and they don't like to be challenged. They don't like the product request to change. Other ones just want attention. And they want to be like, hey, this is a beautiful project. We're thrilled to be part of it. Here's my one question. Could you give feedback? You treat them like the experts they are. They will remember your name and you say, hey, I don't, the last thing I want to be is annoying to you, but we're looking for this. And I recognize you're, you're designing buildings all over the place. Would you be open in the future? If I ever had a question, could I use you as a resource on a simple question regarding roofing or anything else? These guys would be like, oh, no chancy. Love it feel free. Here's my number. Call me anytime, 24 seven, like building those relationships and being known as the guy who is the architect whisperer, real values there for, for sure. I love that. I'm going to throw in an easy one here. I'm up to 10 right now, sending in a book. And occasionally when I will say this, I will say, Hey, if I'm thinking through kind of my checklist, I'm trying to get someone's attention somewhere along the line, I will send one of my books. And the response I get most often is, well, sure. Hartman, you're being kind of pompous here. Well, not everyone's written a book. I say, yeah, this just in. You don't have to send your book. Now, it also says it's never been easier in the history of the world to come up. What if you wrote your own book and it was 12 pages long and it was the top 12 insights I learned in 2020? And each one is 100 words long and you shared that, you sent it to the printer, you, you spent 25 bucks and you got an ISBN number. Great, you're a published author, right? But you can also, there's a millions of books that are out there that would be relevant and mm -hmm. there's always a book that's relevant for some of the pain we're going through. So go buy, you know, whatever. And we'll, we'll have authors on the show. And, I'm, and I mean this, I'm like, go buy a hundred of them. What do they cost? 12 bucks? When you give a book to someone, even if they don't read it, it's probably going to sit on their desk. And worst case scenario, it makes them look smart to other people. Like, so that's just an easy way. And then especially if you find guys that are readers, that's an easy way to deliver value there as well. I think too, I mean, we miss too much. Everybody kind of knows, okay, I want to talk about if I see a fishing plaque on, on somebody's desk Correct. when we walk in, or you might have the Cowboys, Dallas Cowboys banner. But if we really become students of our clients and get to know them, I mean, I've had luck with, I texted one specific client here and never get a response ever. And in the last year, his high school, the town where I knew he went to, went to the state basketball tournament. Okay. And I just shot a quick text message and I said, hey, looks like uh, the Tigers are going to finally make it. Good luck. And that's the first time I got a response to a text message in two years of trying. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we can walk away from business just for a minute and think, how can I make this so personal yeah. that the guy has no choice but to answer? And I think that does open doors. And like your book idea is kind of along the same line. You're, you're not trying to sell at that moment. You're trying to bring that value and, and bring something different. Yeah. And especially here with, with March Madness starting and you can go on Instagram, go on LinkedIn. You can find out where people went to school or if they have an affinity towards a school. We've got one guy who after, oh man, six, maybe seven years of relationships, friendly relationships, we've gotten to the point where we're partnering and we're getting money from them. We nurture that relationship and the core of that relationship was Big Ten football and basketball. And I just got a text from the other day and he said, congratulations on the fighting Illini who they're relevant once every 20 years. They got a number one seed. We went back and forth there. And it's those sorts of things that 
And I always say fun ain't free and it never goes on sale. All things being equal, Chancey, you're a fun, smart guy. Oh, I need more fun, smart people in my life. So I'm open to that, yep. you know? So finding ways to do that. And again, not just looking the traditional ways to connect with people is certainly, certainly going to work. I'm going to throw in there. I think that's 12. Dude, I go, I have an idea I'm going to bring out later uh, and we're going to come out with some kind of ridiculous ways to make this really relevant and make it a ton of fun. I'm going to put that in the bag, but it has, has to do with handwritten notes. Yeah. Handwritten notes never go out of style, especially if they're either heartfelt, if they're interesting, if they're just thank you for your business, spending time when it's so easier to send an email or a voicemail or send something, there's still something to that. And I believe it goes to the core of kind of human nature of someone caring enough to spend a minute to write down their thoughts in legible handwriting and mail it. You know, I still think there's a ton of value there. Yeah, I, I had a client recently, a, an older gentleman, and I was coming into his office over and over and hadn't got anywhere purchasing yet. But he was a humorous guy. I, I liked him a lot. But and he said, Chancy, like a bad nickel, you just keep rolling back in here every time, just like a bad nickel. <laughs> and I, I never heard that expression. So the next time I went in, he wasn't there and I had a nickel and I taped it to a piece of paper and I put it on his desk and I just left it and said, I was here. I wrote on there. His secretary said he got a great kick out of that. Then they actually are buying now. So it makes the story all that much better, right? When they uh, became a customer. But I think you need to be creative. You need to make it fun. Yeah. You know, if you're going to have that banter, let's have some fun with it, you know, and, and not be uh, too proud not to make fun of yourself, be a little self-deprecating and, yes. and understand where we're at, you know, so... This is a little bit stranger, but in the same vein, I once bet a, a client and I knew it was a Super Bowl, and I was like, I'm pretty sure I'm going to lose this bet. And he, goes, he said, what should we bet? I said, a tube sock full of nickels. And he was like, <laughs> and he's like what? I'm like, literally a tube sock. I'm talking like 1980 style, LA Lakers, Michael Cooper style, go past the knee, tube sock full of nickels. And he was like, are you, I can't tell if you're being serious or joking. I'm like, I am dead serious. You're going to have to go to the bank. You're going to ask him. You'd be shocked how many nickels can fit in a tube sock. And he's like, he's like, whatever. He's like, fine. He's like, I was just hoping we could do like 20 bucks or like a steak dinner. I'm like, no, let's do this. I ended up losing and I went through that and I, I thoroughly enjoyed every minute. The shipping on a tube sock full of nickels is like a hundred dollars. It is unbelievably heavy, but I'm like, it's got to go through the mail. Anyway, he will, uh, God, this is about a decade ago. He will still tell people, he's like, dude, he sent me a tube sock full of nickels. And people are like, what? Like, you gave him a story that he will never, ever forget. And, you know, we're still doing business today. <laughs> I would keep that tube sock of nickels on my desk if I was him, just as a reference point. And then if, uh, if a salesperson was getting too outlandish, you just threaten to club him with the uh, tube sock full of nickels. I think that might be an old mob technique or something. I, I'm pretty sure it is. Along the line of books, it's never been easier now. And again, with what's happening we're just hearing more and more. LBM Journal just has a new recruiting podcast coming up. The folks at the SBCA, they got a couple different podcasts on different facets of the construction community. It's never been easier to say, I was listening to this podcast, Chancy, I thought you'd find it relevant. And what I often hear is say, well, what if they don't listen to a podcast? Then I deliver no value. I'll say, you almost hope they don't because, and maybe it's not this year, maybe it's in the future, Sooner or later, they're going to realize they're driving around listening to AM or FM radio and ESPN 1000 or Taylor Swift songs instead of learning about how to improve their business. You will be the person that can change their life. All right. Now, I'm certainly biased on the whole podcasting thing, but I'm like, it's never been easier to share something. And that's just truly in a way that, hey, I think you'll get value from this. There's smart people talking. Chancy, I'm going to do this for you. You've been awesome. There's lots of ideas here. I'm, I, we're up to 13, I think, so far. What else? Did we miss anything on, on your list over there? Well, the number one I would do right now, the last one, and it's not one you always want to lead with, okay. but is the ability to price lock something. Okay. With prices increasing, you always have that option of going to somebody. Oftentimes, we struggle here with getting a commitment on a project. We want the order, right? Yep. And sometimes you need a deadline. And sometimes these price increases aren't the worst thing in the world in order to get a commitment. And I will just say, hey, the pricing, we're good through here. If you give me the order by Friday, I will lock you in. Mm -hmm. And 
there's some security and a lot of guys like hearing that and they just want to take that edge, that problem off their table. So the idea of promising to lock something in for somebody, provided it's a good deal on your end, obviously, sure. is value. So, and that can be a short conversation saying, would you like us to lock you in on this pallet of coil nails to a 10,000 square project, whatever it might be. So I, I like the idea of using the term lock it in. So. Yeah. And I think this is certainly going to, isn't going to last forever, heaven forbid. But when we're talking about allocation, that means people like you, when you do get product, you have choices on to whom you can sell it. All right. The power right now is on the sellers, not the buyers. So there's a certain understanding that you're giving them deferential treatment. If you can go say, hey, I thought of you for this and hey, I don't want to be smarmy, but this deal ain't going to last. You literally have by Friday, but yep. I, I wanted to make sure you know, I was thinking about you and I called you first. And if it doesn't exactly. fit, hey, right, knock on wood, six months from now, it's not going to work. But now, absolutely it does. And I mean, if you can do that and you should obviously do it with some authenticity and you can be really direct with it, but deadlines really help force people. And I think these are conversations that you really have to get in front of right now and be real direct and honest because that's what everyone's really struggling with that right now. Yeah, it, it's a business by business decision. If it makes sense for your business, for your current inventory situation and for what your business goals are for that year. So, well, hey man, this was fantastic. And dude, when you, when you initially reached out to me, I was like, dude, this is great. And my response to you was, hey, do you have any ideas? The answer is hell yes, you do. And you, you brought a ton of value to this. So I really appreciate that. The one thing that we didn't talk about here, but I just think is really important is when you send an email, you leave a voicemail, maybe you send a handwritten note, maybe you dropped off a box of donuts. All right, let's say you did those four things. If you don't hear anything back, that four attempts from a how humans feel about rejection, and that's what it's going to feel like, it could feel like 12, right? Yep. And so often people are like, dude, I'm just, we're moving on. This isn't an opportunity. He's not responding. And I'm saying, how long have you been pursuing it? Oh, I don't know. It feels like nine months. I'm like, walk me through what you've done. We often find that in our mind, it becomes much bigger than it was. And we, if we don't track when and what we did over time, the emotion will overtake any sort of logic. And right behind me, you can see I got this two foot Ted Williams which is really tied into actually from a podcast we did and I built on it. So we send these two foot Ted's all across the country. We did about 50 of them and we're leveraging some of his insights from the science of hitting as they related to sales and goal setting. Anyway, we send them all out and there's a handful of them, probably a dozen that I had to reach out and then say, Hey, did you get this? And all in, it was probably like a hundred bucks plus shipping. And, and we put a lot of time and effort into it. And my team was like getting upset. I'm like, we sent these to these people and they didn't even respond. I said, listen, hey, they're busy. If we're delivering value, all we can do, we can control, we can control. We can't do more than that. And I think it's just really important that we need to say is number one, track the attempts and don't get emotional. People are busy, drop the ego. And just because you have reached out four times or eight times or 12 times, you know what? People are busy, give them the benefit of the doubt. And at the end of the day, they're dealing with probably bigger things than you. So I think that's just so important to kind of keep a positive mindset when it comes to this whole effort that we've been talking about. Absolutely. Positivity is important. And Ted Williams probably was like this too. I, you go on hot and cold streaks. Yes. I mean, mm -hmm. you can go nine for 10 in one, two game stretch and then go 0 for five the next day. And that's kind of how I find prospecting. I mean, we can go on some pretty dry runs and that is when negativity can creep in and then yeah. you get a week where you land three prospects. So you need to just stick with it and keep consistent. So love it. Well, hey man, I think this is a great place to end. I want to thank you for reaching out and you've been extremely insightful. You've brought a ton of value to this. Thank you. Thanks for having me on, Brad. I just wanted to bring some practical knowledge to the business and I enjoy your podcast and Jenny, thanks so much for having me on. Thank you. Appreciate it. As always, thank you for listening. I hope you found my conversation with Mr. Chansey Halverson of Gulf Eagle Supply to be worth your time and attention. If you did, do not hesitate to share this with your sales colleagues. There's so many folks that really struggle with this and we literally rattled off, I don't know, 12, 13, 14 different tactical ideas that people can start using today. So I really appreciate Chansey driving the bus on this one. So several listeners have reached out and said, hey man, what happened? What happened to the Muji moment? 
they've been gone for so long. And quite frankly, we've had a lot of projects going on and there's been no shortage of things that we could be recommending. But when it comes time to record, we always seem to be pressed for time and often forget. But that is not the case here. I've got something I'm thrilled to recommend. This has just been a joy to read and extremely valuable. I've already bought several of these to give to clients. I got a book recommendation from Mr. Ben Horowitz. So Ben Horowitz, he's in the tech space. He's in venture capital. He wrote a book that many of you might have heard or have read called The Hard Thing About Hard Things, which is really about being a leader in a growing business, one that eventually went public and kind of his personal story of growing a business and building a culture. And he's just a different guy. And on one hand, he's a multi-billionaire, I'm fairly certain, yet He's someone that you could just envision having a beer with and extremely bright is a wonderful storyteller. He's got a new book. I missed it. It came out a few months ago, uh, but it's called What You Do Is Who You Are, subtitle, How to Create Your Business Culture. And this is something that we talk a lot about with our Red Angle business that dives into a lot of issues that our clients have regarding employing Hispanics and the different cultural barriers that are there or selling to Hispanics and how we build trust and persuasion. And we often talk about culture. And at the end of the day, regardless of who you're collaborating with, culture comes down to behaviors. This idea about values, these are principles, these are ideas, that's great. Yet it ultimately comes down to how you behave, how you act, and how you set the tone to drive and influence and persuade other people's behavior. And that's what this book is about. It's extremely entertaining It's got some wonderful stories in it. It's called What You Do Is Who You Are, How to Create Your Business Culture. If this idea of culture, and for many of our clients, we are talking about this culture of sales accountability, of doing what you said you're going to do, and it's not easy. It's not easy changing culture, but this book will certainly help you do that. I would strongly recommend it to a friend. Again, Ben Horowitz, What You Do Is Who You Are, How to Create Your Business Culture. So with that, I want to thank our sponsors. You can learn more about Boise Cascades Engineered Wood Products and their innovative Sawtech technology by visiting bc.com slash EWP and our friends at Materials Exchange. What E-Trade is for the stock market, Materials Exchange is to the LBM industry. They make commodity pricing transparent, buying simple, and the fees are low. If you register today and use the promo code Bradley, B-R-A-D-L-E-Y, you can get your first trade free. So there, zero risk. Do it, check it out, see what it's all about. You will be glad you did. I'm confident in saying that. So we're going to close out like we always do. You, my friend, you're owed nothing. Deliver value first.